You can't price your product unless you accurately know how much it costs to produce that product. Today, it's all about the costs that go into raising past your poultry. Stay tuned for that coming up. Welcome to Grass Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego, D I E G O. Grass Fed Life is your go to online resource for all things livestock farming. From free resources like this podcast to free blog posts at grassfedlife.co to mini courses like Profitable Pastured Poultry to our flagship course, The Farm Business Essentials, we have you covered. If you're looking to start a livestock based enterprise, start here first. Learn more at grassfedlife.co. In today's episode, I'm joined by farmer Darby Simpson. And today, Darby and I are talking pastured poultry economics, specifically the economics on the cost side of the income statement, the expenses. One problem that we see a lot, or one question that we get a lot, is how do I price my pastured poultry? You want to go sell at a farmer's market? How do you know how much to sell it for? A lot of people want to start on the I'm going to charge this much side of things. But that's just pulling a number out of air because that number's irrelevant unless you know how much it costs to actually raise that product. You might want to charge $5.50 a pound, but if it's going to cost you $5 a pound to raise that pastured poultry, do you really want to charge $5.50 a pound? It depends. Today, we're going to talk about how you come about that $5 a pound number, or whatever that number is for you. We're going to look at all the input costs that you're going to need to put on an Excel spreadsheet when you go to start your pastured poultry enterprise. This one's number-based, but it's surprisingly simple. So if you're thinking about starting a pastured poultry enterprise, or you're currently operating a pastured poultry enterprise, think about your numbers as you go through this one. Let's jump right into it. It's the cost of raising pastured poultry with Darby Simpson. So if somebody wants to start a pastured poultry enterprise, one of the things I think people have a challenge with is putting together a budget for how much the enterprise is going to cost them. They need to do this so they can figure out how much to charge and thereby how much they're going to make to see is this worth their time. If you're thinking about setting up pastured poultry, you've never done it before, let's use just a standard 100 bird per batch operation. What are the things you need to be thinking about in terms of costs from day one before you start? Yeah, so like just the real basic stuff, like you're going to have line a line item for, you know, um, your chicks, you, you know, your 100 chicks. And uh, you can call some hatcheries. Uh, I always suggest calling hatcheries that will get you the birds within two nights in the mail. That, that'll kind of give you a radius to work from. And you can call and get some prices. And I'd say use the highest price. Know that maybe you might find a hatchery you like better that's a little bit cheaper. But, you know, for this purpose, you're, you're just you're just starting out. you got to put this together. Use the highest price. You're you're talking about maybe it's a dollar fifty per chick versus a dollar twenty per chick or something like that. So it, in the grand scheme of things, it's maybe twenty, thirty, forty dollars difference um, on a hundred birds. It's not that much money. Uh, you're going to have shipping from that hatchery, so you want to you know a lot of times you can get on their website and uh, they'll have a uh, a scale uh, that says you know you're in this zone. Uh, so find your zip code and it's going to be about this much money per hundred chicks, or you can even call them and get a quote that that'd be another line item that you'd put right into your Excel spreadsheet. Um, obviously you're going to have to have feed. You're going to have to determine, you know, um, and this gets into marketing a little bit, really like, you know, what kind of feed do I want to use? What kind of feed do I have access to? Do I want to be, uh, non-GMO or organic or soy free, or like I'm going to be conventional because that's all I can find. You got to start calling some grain mills and, and, and getting, you know, kind of a cost per pound. Um, or you could even just use, you know, bad feed if you wanted to, just to kind of get going, uh, from, from like a local feed store, you know, tractor supply, rural King, something along those lines. But just know that like each one of your birds are probably, I use about 16 pounds of feed per bird. 
So we're going to have about 1,600 pounds of feed total. Um, and, and not to get too nuanced here, this really this really comes into to play more as we uh, we start talking about you know economies of scale. But um, typically, you're going to have a 21% protein that you'll start the birds on, and then you'll drop them down to like a 19 or an 18 later on, and that's going to be a little bit cheaper. But again, I think if you can get a price per 50 pounds or per 100 pounds of you know like 21% protein again just to put in this spreadsheet to get a really solid number and you're figuring on 1600 pounds of feed like you're going to be so super close to what you need uh it's it's nuance after that uh we're gonna have some money for grit uh to to give the birds while they're in the brooder we're gonna have some money on another line item for bedding um i put some money in there for uh, electricity to run my, my brooder lamps. And it's, it's not a lot, but I, I think I've got like 50 bucks, which it's probably not that much. But again, I'm trying to make sure I don't short myself, you know, and, and that's, that's what I'm trying to, to help someone do is they're putting together their first spreadsheet uh, for a, for a pasture poultry enterprise uh, to, to get a, a bulk amount of money in there for that. Um, you know, that, that, that bedding, it might be $5 a bag, you know, just, just plan on, you know, 25, 30, 40 bucks, just get it in there. Uh, these are things you can, as you progress through, uh, you know, this enterprise and your, your farming career, like you'll learn like, okay, well with X birds, I need this much bedding. I used this much grit, you know, you keep records. Um, and then I also will put in fuel. Uh, to, you know, my case, I'm hauling them to a processor. I got to go to the post office and pick them up. I got to go, uh, you know, uh, two, two trips to the processor, actually one to drop them off, one to pick them up. Uh, you might have, if you're using ice, if you've got to drive really, really far, you might have some bagged ice or, uh, something like that. But these are all direct costs. These are directly related to, you know, the cost to produce the bird. Um, and then, you know, you're also, you're going to have your butchering fee in there. So that's another, that's another thing you got to do. You got to start looking at, well, okay, well in my state, am I required to butcher at a state inspected facility, a USDA facility? Are we exempt? Can I, can I process on farm? You know, if I'm going to process on farm, you know, what are my, my costs there? And there's, We've, we've got a whole nother podcast coming up on that. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for that podcast, but you've got to put this line on them in again for butchering your birds. But we really start to build out our spreadsheet once we've, we've got all these core numbers in there. And if you think about that spreadsheet, I mean, the big movers on there, at least from my perspective, are feed and butchering. Those are the ones that are going to push that number up or drop it down. You're not going to go broke because you got to buy an extra bag of grit and you're not going to save money by getting your bag of grit, you know, for a dollar cheaper. Right. Exactly. Those are the two biggest expenses. Um, and, and then, you know, as an extension of that, like, okay, well, how far am I driving? So, you know, there maybe might be, you know, more, quite a bit more fuel in there. Uh, I know some people, you know, our friend John Siskovich, like his butcher is far enough away that like he stays all day. You know, uh, he works on some other stuff at a coffee shop, but, you know, he he's got lunch in there. Uh, he's, you know, got got coffee. He's got hours that he's, you know, budgeting, you know, a whole day of being away from maybe another job or something like that. So those are kind of some things you got to think about. But you're right. The butchering uh, and the feed are the absolute two biggest expenses and that's probably, honestly, where you're going to spend the most time researching, making phone calls, finding out what are my butchering options? What kind of grain mills are around me? Or am I going to have to ship feed in? Uh, you know, guys that have been through our course uh, from the south, you know, down in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, like they oftentimes to get the kind of feed they want, they might have to have it shipped in from a great distance away. And there, there's an expense there. So that's this is all stuff you've got to look at. How much time do you think somebody puts into selecting a hatchery and getting the right cost on birds? That seems like a little trip up point that a lot of people could get caught up on. Do you just use your rule of thumb of get one that can get you 
the birds within a timely manner that's got a decent reputation and that's good enough, you know, saving 10 or 15 cents a bird, who cares? Yeah, I think when we're talking particularly about just getting started on 100, 100 chickens, like, you know, saving 10 or 15 bucks on that, it, I think I, I think that the the issue with the hatchery is more nuanced in terms of do you like the genetics they have? How do they do in your climate? You know your region um, availability. If we start talking about producing multiple batches per year, uh, th- things of that nature. You know how 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 good do they get handled through their their post office to your post office? There's more nuance relational decisions that, that that come into play with a hatchery in terms of getting a budget i look at you know three or four options again within two nights through the mail to where you're located y- you could just take three or four numbers at them together and, and divide and get an average to, to use but I, I say use the high one and then if you here here's the bright spot if you put in a buck 50 per chick and you end up spending a dollar twenty, well, then you're a little bit more profitable, and you can put that on uh, Excel spreadsheet Mark II as, uh, hey, I, I lowered my cost here a little bit, right? Um, or hey, I found a cheaper grain mill, or maybe the feed was a little bit more expensive than I anticipated, and I need to bump that up. Uh, that all goes into tracking to continually update your Excel spreadsheet. Now, look, I've been doing poultry for 12 years. And I still, the first thing I do when I get into January and I get back to it after a break is go through and update all my pricing. I contact the grain mill. I contact the butcher. I contact the hatchery. I look at all these big expenses and and make sure that my spreadsheet is in line so that I've got a very, uh, you know, up, updated projection of what my costs are. So if I'm going to make any changes to my pricing structure, like it's got to happen then because we, we've always marketed a good portion of our birds through a bulk program. And like, I've got to know what my retail price is before I can start thinking about any kind of a discount for that bulk program. And that all starts every year. Like I, having done this for 12 seasons, like I still go through this exercise every single year. And a lot of those costs, they're going to be what they are. You can't change them much or there's not a lot of variability in them. You know, shopping the birds around or the chicks around at different hatcheries, you're not going to save a lot. Your butcher, you may only have one option, so you're you're stuck with that cost unless you want to go the route of processing on farm. But feed could be a variable because you can likely get feed and then you're going to have options within feed. Do you think that when people start out, they have a couple options on their spreadsheet for feed, thinking along the lines of, okay, conventional is going to cost me this per pound. Non-GMO is going to cost me this per pound. Corn and soy free is going to cost me this per pound. Organic is going to cost me this much. My thinking there is you list out those different types of costs in all the sheets. You see what that pushes your final cost to. And then you got to look to the top of the sheet and say, okay, based on if I'm selling a chicken with organic feed, here's my cost. I got to be selling it up at this amount. Can I reach people who are going to pay that amount? Can I actually charge that amount? Can I convey that story that makes people want to pay that amount? And how confident am I in that? Otherwise, I may want to be organic, but... I might have to go down to non-GMO because it's 20 cents a pound cheaper. Right. And that, that really kind of gets into your marketing strategy and doing some more research. Uh, and this is something I talk a lot about in the course, researching your competition, researching the markets you want to sell into like that. That exercise might help you decide if you've got all these these variable feed options available, like which one am I going to go with and why? It will give you confidence in in making that decision. Um, and I think if you do enough research for a lot of us, particularly if you're in the Midwest, upper Midwest, um, even the East Coast, uh, not extreme South. I'm not talking southern Southern Florida, but you know Georgia, up through you know Missouri, Kansas, Iowa 
Minnesota, kind of that big, big sphere, right? You've probably got more feed options than you realize. Um, so I'd say make four copies of your, your spreadsheet and just change the grain from conventional to non GMO to organic to soy free or corn and soy free or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then kind of start to take a look at the competition and maybe you realize like, Hey, I can actually do certified organic and I'm only going to be 50 cents more per pound than these two competitors over here who are, I think, I think they're conventional based what I can tell from their website or having spoken with them or talked to the butcher or, or whatever. Like it might make a really savvy marketing decision to, to use a, a different grain. Um, and I will say that grain and not to get too far ahead here, like when you first start out, grain's going to be expensive because you're buying it in small batches. You might be buying it in pre-made 50 pound bags. You know, you might maybe buy a pallet at a time possibly to kind of get your costs down. But just know that as we progress forward with our enterprise, and again, we can talk more later about economies of scale, grain offers us the uh, greatest area to reduce costs. Because if we go from buying 500 pounds of ground feed custom mix for us in bags, which is what I started with, like I didn't need more than that, right? Um, our, our costs are higher. I mean, a grain mill is going to charge you more to do that. Whereas today when I'm getting chicken feed, I'm getting three and a half to four tons at a time. And that has drastically reduced my price per pound, even though I'm paying for a bulk truck to bring it down. Like it has, it's, it's cut our feed costs from what it was years ago by about 33%. So just keep that in the back of your mind. No, in the beginning, it's going to be more expensive, but it's something we can work on later. It's, it's the one, it's the one area we've got the biggest variable. You're right. These other things like, okay, I love this hatchery. Me personally, I love Schlecht hatchery. I don't care if they're chickens or a dollar 20 or dollar 60. Like that's who I'm using, right? My butcher is going to charge what they're going to charge. Gasoline is what gasoline is. But my feed, there's a whole lot of variability there. One thing to think about on feed is this and really the, the type of chicken are the two, and I guess the methods of how the chicken are raised, that's how you manufacture your product here. You know, I, I sell stuff that's made in a factory. And some of it's commodity, some of it is unique, exclusive. But in a farm... You know, you're manufacturing it in the field as you raise the animals. How you differentiate your product is based upon what product you produce, what product you raise. And if it's a Cornish cross, your only differentiating factor is your methods and what feed you put into it and maybe how it's treated on pasture. You could go to a potentially different type of bird if the market cared about that. But from talking to enough people on the show, I'm not sure that markets totally value a different breed of bird. So as you're compiling this spreadsheet, thinking about the factors, the numbers that go on it, what do those numbers represent? How do they flow through to the final marketing? Because everybody's selling chicken. The only thing differentiating your chicken from somebody else's is the labeling, the story that you're going to tell about it and what went behind it, make sure that your story and the numbers work together. You don't want to go overspend to get a great story to where you push your costs up so high that your product has to be astronomically priced. And you don't want to just chase the dollars because now you're selling a commodity product and you're competing with Tyson and you're never going to win that battle. Right. And I, you know, I think for us, like what the chicken ate and how we manage them on pasture, those are two things that I intimately integrate into every conversation I have with a, with a new or prospective, uh, shopper or, um, you know, maybe, maybe someone who is just starting to investigate all this and they're asking questions, um, I, I really differentiate myself by saying, you know, we move our chickens to fresh grass every day. This guarantees that 
you know, they're eating as much green forage as possible. They're eating as many bugs as possible. This really reduces grain consumption. But oh, by the way, that grain is certified organic and I'm the only person at this market that's feeding their, their pastured chickens, you know, certified organic feed. Um, so that kind of starts to play into that justification of, well, everybody here is between four and six dollars a pound. You know, you're you're up closer to the six dollars. Like, why? Why are you a dollar fifty per pound more than the guy down the way? Well, I'm using organic feed. So on a four pound chicken, yeah, it's six dollars more. But, you know, I don't personally want to consume Roundup Ready soybeans or you know, corn that's been sprayed with all these chemicals. Um, so to me, it's, it's worth that extra, you know, five, six bucks a chicken. And a certain number of people are going to dig what you're doing. They dig what I'm doing. They vote with their wallet. They vote with their feet. Some people are like, eh, I just want local. That's fine. You know, they're, they're going to go buy the cheapest option at the farmer's market. Like for me, like at the end of the day, that's, that's not my customer. That's not who I'm after. When you think about the product that you're selling to these customers on the spreadsheet so far, we have the hard costs. How much does the product cost? How much does it cost to feed it? All the inputs that go into it. Let's put labor aside. Let's put infrastructure aside. When you have all these things totaled up. How do you think you approach dealing with the accuracy of the assumptions that you've made, the numbers that you've gotten, and building in a fudge factor? Well, I, I think if, you, if you've done due diligence, if, you, if you've made your phone calls, right, on the feed, the hatcheries, the butcher, like those are, those are your big, big expenses. Uh, the other stuff I talked about, electricity, bedding, grit, things of that nature, I mean, e even if you whiff on those. I mean, we're talking about, okay, you put in $25 and it should have been 50 at the end of the day. Like that's not going to kill you. That's a paper cut on a landmine. You fix that on batch number two, you fix that on the next spreadsheet because you track your data. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how I answer those things. As far as a fudge factor, I still put in a death rate and I assume that like I have, I've got all the expenses for this chicken built into my spreadsheet, except they didn't get butchered because they died on day 60 before we took them to the butcher and I used 10%, 10% uh, death loss. That really covers me for birds that are absolutely going to die uh, for, you know, costs that I've got in them from paying for the chick, getting them shipped. I've fed them for a while. Like, and it's, that's, for me, that's pretty high. I think your first batch, you might want to go a little bit higher. You might say 15%, maybe even 20. And I, I think that's, that's relative to chickens. If we're talking about turkeys, you're going to want to go even higher yet. But with, with chickens, I think if you plan on a 20% a loss, you're, you're more than covered. And I know that probably sounds high, but brooder management is really hard. You're probably going to make some mistakes on pasture and, I always want to come out better in reality than what I had projected on the spreadsheet. And then as we gain experience, we can modify that spreadsheet again, track the data, put the data in, update that every time we have a batch of chickens until we get this dude really, really humming. And we're like 96, 98% accurate, which is kind of where we're at now, right? Unless we have some kind of catastrophic event where a whole bunch of chickens die that we didn't anticipate. Like we're, we're really super accurate on, uh, you know, all of our, all of our expenses. The other thing you want to be careful with, and this kind of starts to get into how much we can charge is like, what's my finish weight going to be? Um, I say maybe early on put in four pounds per chicken really to be super profitable. Long term, we, we really want to aim for like a four and a half to five pound chicken. I found that kind of difficult to obtain. Well, the very first batch of chickens I did, they were like six pounds. And I thought I had it all figured out. And then I really struggled. And, and what I struggled with was starting them too early. It was too cold, too rainy for them to, to gain those weights. I, I raised them at a very optimal time of year my first time. So 
projecting every realistic finish weight is also really key. I think that's the other big thing that you can miss on. It's something that I missed on for a year or two until I kind of got stuff figured out. So your fudge factor is really in estimating low on a finish weight versus high and estimating at a higher death rate than low. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And even with those things, like you're still going to make money. Like you're still going to make money. You're not going to lose money. Um, and when you're just starting out and, and you know this because you've started multiple businesses, like if I can show that I'm making money and this is particularly in this instance, this is a, this is a side hustle, right? I'm not relying on this to pay a bill. Um, making money and having positive cash flow, like that's enormous traction for starting your business. And pro you're probably, if you're cautious, you're going to make more money than you anticipate. You get some experience, you get some confidence, you get some hard data. It's that second, that third batch where we can really start to tweak things and, and, and kind of estimate a little bit closer to reality based on past experiences to dial in that, that profitability and really dial in like, well, this is what I think I need to sell at or what I can sell at. This is how I fit into the market in, in my area w with my farm. You know, um, I've talked with customers now. I know that organic is really important or I know that organic's not important at all. You know, maybe you start to make some model changes a little bit. You know, this is, th these are all things that you can start to gently massage as you progress forward. Always updating that spreadsheet. You're always, always, always updating that spreadsheet and keeping the old ones so we can see where we started and where we're at now. And in thinking about business progression and what you're trying to have that business do, one thing you need to think about is time. How do you value your time? And I'll circle back and I'll get your thoughts on it. This is These are my thoughts. If you're doing this on the side, and it's a side hustle that gives you bonus money. Personally, I'm more concerned about valuing my time there because I'm borrowing that time away from other things that I would do and I want to make sure that time pays. If I already have a full-time job, then I'm using free time to take away from family, interests, hobbies, whatever, to do this side thing I need to know that the side thing makes sense given the time that I'm putting in. If I'm trying to do it full time, this is me. I don't care about my time going in because I look at it as a step to build something bigger. And I've done enough with business to know now that when you're building a long-term thing, it's going to come out to the equation's always going to look like we're going to put a bunch of hours in now. And then eventually those hours taper down as the thing grows. Like hours don't necessarily scale up linearly with growth. It usually takes a bunch of hours to get it going and then it starts to grow. And then those hours maintain and eventually growth supersedes the effort that you're putting in. And I think if you try and price your startup hours in, especially if you're building things like chicken tractors and all that, your first batch is going to come out terrible because you're going to see all the hours to build the website, to build the chicken tractors, to do your marketing, and you're never going to make money. So I... Even when I look at paper pot now, I don't look at my hours because I say, hey, these hours are going to make something that I want to last 10 years. And when it gets to 10 years, it's going to be uh, a, f a factor of X greater than it is today. And I need just need to put the hours in to scale it to that size. So if it's a side hustle, I am more in tune with my time because I want to make sure my side hustle pays. It, it's not necessarily looking to go big. It's just there to provide bonus money, or it's a hobby, um, or it's there just to provide bonus money. So that time needs to make sense. If it's growing a bigger enterprise, where the goal is big, where the goal is longevity for the long term, I'm not as concerned about time there in the beginning because I already know time is going to be, I'm going to have to put a ton in at the beginning. 
and it's never going to pencil out on a hundred birds. Generally speaking, I, I would agree with that. Um, so if we're talking about a side hustle and it's going to remain a side hustle, then yeah, your, your time early on, like maybe that first batch or, or two, you don't care about it a whole lot, but you're, you're keeping an eye on it, but you really want to make sure that, you know, moving forward, it makes sense. Right. Uh, particularly like if you've got a good paying job and it's like, well, you know, I could put this same time in at my job and make an extra $20,000 a year, but I can only make $500 with chicken. Well, th there has to be a really heavy, uh, personal context. I want to go do chicken versus I want to make money decision there. Um, I'm with you when you know, you're building something bigger. Now I would say on the production side, I still want to track my time early on. Like how much time am I spending in the brooder? How much time am I spending managing the birds on pasture? Because the way I've developed my spreadsheets is to look at, you know, and today we're doing batches of 600. You know, how many hours does it take me to manage 600 birds? Because then that really shows me like how much money I can make per hour on my labor with a given enterprise. And there's a whole bunch of reasons to to track that that I won't get into here. Um, but I'm with you. When, if we're talking about building a chicken tractor, building a brooder, setting up a website, like that is just the cost of doing business. Um, the the particularly the time you put into those things. I don't think you can calculate that into was this profitable from a dollars per hour standpoint, because once I get my website done, like it's just maintenance and it's a, we have to have this, like we're not legitimate without it. And yes, you are not legitimate if you don't have a website for your farm. Like you've got to have a, at least a simple landing page for people to go to, to, to learn about you. And you've got to have some kind of social media whether that's Instagram or Facebook or both or whatever, like you've got to have something that legitimizes you in the eyes of a customer. Building chicken tractors, even the cost of that infrastructure, it's really hard to factor that into, well, do I include this or not to be quote unquote profitable? And I fall on the side of not really, not really because that chicken tractor, I mean, my chicken tractor, the, the design that I've come up with that I've used, and even this newer design that we're, we, we've come up with, the old ones lasted 10 years. It's had thousands and thousands of birds run through it. The, the cost per bird to run it through that chicken tractor is like literally down into like the one to two pennies per bird range. It's so incredibly low. It doesn't even bear mentioning, in my opinion. Now, if you have a different opinion on that, that's fine. That's a point of disagreement that we have in business. Um, but it's it's like it's the cost of doing business. Like you can't go have a chicken enterprise if you don't build the chicken tractor. So just know that, like, look, I've got 300 bucks Maybe, you know, that this first batch of chickens, I'm going to make at least $300. Well, poof, they paid for the chicken tractor. Now it's in the, the feeders and the water. That's all now free and clear. And moving forward, I can just look at my direct costs. And that's really how I tend to look at a lot of things on my farm. The way we price stuff, the way market stuff is once we run one batch of chickens through a new chicken tractor, like that dude's paid for. So it's it's an afterthought. It's gone. It's in It's in the back of my mind. I'm more concerned with my ongoing direct production costs, not that my website costs me a hundred dollars a year to re-register the domain and do maintenance and, you know, pay a web guy for some updates and stuff like that. Like I don't try and factor in that hundred bucks into the cost of my chicken. Um, and I, I think if you focus on the spreadsheet, you focus on the direct costs and you track your time in terms of, this is what it takes to produce a chicken time wise. Th then we've got some really good metrics to make sure that we're, we're charging enough. We're, and we can pay ourselves adequately for our time moving forward into that long-term model that you discussed where 
I'm putting in the time now and knowing that later it's going to get uber efficient. And I can make really good money with this enterprise. Yeah, I agree with you on the infrastructure. I don't think it's worth the headache or confusion of trying to include that on a bird by bird basis. I look at it like who cares what that spreadsheet says? If you need to build this equipment before you start raising the enterprise, it's going to cost you this many dollars. Like you have to outlay that cash at day zero before that spreadsheet even becomes relevant. So I look at that as here's your upfront cost. Once the enterprise is ongoing, here's your direct cost associated on a per unit basis. Infrastructure's already been paid for. If you think about something you've mentioned a few times, it, it's scaling up and economies of scale. One thing that could be a trap is you have somebody who starts raising 100 birds and they think, okay, well, I'm buying, you know, now feed by the bag and it's $36 for a 50 pound bag. If I go buy it by a pallet or a bulk truck, maybe that 36 goes down to 25 my thought is I, I caution people on falling in love with economies of scale because you have to survive the first batch to get to the next step up in the growth of your business. And if the first batch numbers don't work, who cares what the economies of scale are? But the devil's advocate to that is sometimes you got to kind of just eat hay for the first batch to get through it, get everything working, to work out the kinks, and then you refine later on, and that's where that economies of scale comes in. So you're you're not as concerned with making money in the beginning. You're just concerned with surviving and growth and building that equity in the business and building the market, knowing that if things play out, if you get up to a certain size, that's when the real money comes in. And it, it it's... I don't know what a, what an official business coach would say there, but there's kind of the trap of falling in love with also just saying, well, the early stuff doesn't matter. We just have to stay solvent. Making money isn't as, isn't important early as on because we're going to make a bunch later. Huh, I, I've I've got a number of thoughts here. I, like I want to make money early on because again, I want to be cash flow positive and I want to use that that money to quote unquote you know, pay for that infrastructure if I can. Um, it makes it a whole lot easier, particularly like if, if take, take me for example, in 2007, I scrounged up about 600 bucks to start a business that today is selling $200,000 worth of product. Um, we grew it slowly. We reinvested those funds. So I think you know, making money early on, particularly if you're on a tighter budget, like that's important. I think if you're cash flow positive, that's more important than saying, well, I'm making X dollars per hour. I don't think you can really look at that early on for a number of reasons. The biggest one probably being economies of scale. And there is a danger there of, of swinging the other way. You know, so one 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 failure I see is nobody does this pre-mortem. They don't put numbers together at all. And then the other thing is they don't put together a marketing plan. I think you're, in a way, really, your marketing should drive your production. So if you're building your marketing list, well, that means you should be building sales. And that should kind of help determine like how much stuff you produce, like how fast you grow, how fast you reinvest. Do we, hey, this is going well. We started with $1,000. We Do we as a business, as a family, whatever, we have a, a contextual discussion. Do we want to pull some money out of savings? Do we want to go get a small little business loan of $5,000 to kind of get this puppy up and moving faster because there's more demand than there is production? Um, and then it's okay. It's okay to look at those economies of scale. And in fact, I think particularly with poultry, like you kind of have to look at economies of scale from a mental standpoint. Because it is so much work, it's so labor intensive that if you just look at the profitability from a batch of 100 chickens, like you, you've you got to be able to rationally look at those projections down the road. 
So you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I also know people who have, like, they raised 50 chickens. They did it well. They took that economy of scale Excel spreadsheet and went ape with it. And the next thing I knew, they told me, yeah, we, we're butchering 600 chickens every three weeks for the next, you know, five, you know, like 15 weeks. We're going to put 3,000 chickens in the freezer. Well, they didn't have the marketing list to deal with that or to cash flow that. And then, oh, by the way, they went out and spent $15,000 on a walk-in freezer that they really didn't need so chicken could just sit there. And then they tried to go build the marketing list. So there's there's a danger there of, yeah, you can really get your costs down, particularly with that that grain, uh, that you you almost you want to ramp up too fast. And I think there's a balance here between all of these different things, all these moving parts of letting the marketing drive the production, maybe being a little bit edgy of production with production so you can get your cost per bird down so you can make more money per hour or per chicken, per chicken or per pig or per cow or whatever it is you're looking at. Um, but it, like you, you don't want to mash the accelerator, right? You, you want a nice smooth acceleration up to the top of the bell curve. Um, and there's just a real balance there. And I, that's, that's something that you've really kind of got to go, you know, you got to go slow enough to know like, well, no, we can speed up a little bit or we, we need to slow down a little bit. If you just try to go from zero to 60 and you'll crash and burn. And, and by the way, that other farm I mentioned ended in divorce and a near failed business. And it, it, like it was a mess. And that, that's what playing around with Excel uh, too liberally can can lead to if you're not careful. So when you take what Excel spits out and everything that we've talked about, you have a cost number of X into a bird per pound when you factor it all in. Now it comes into how much do you mark it up? And do you look at it as well, I want to make 30% or I want to make 50% and I'll figure out a way to make that sale happen? Or do you look at it like, well, here's what my competitors are. They're charging this. My product's different. So I can be priced here. And that might not meet your margin that you want to, which you're just in theory, pulling out of your head? That's a really tough question to answer, um, particularly on poultry. Because we're used to poultry being the least expensive meat in the supermarket. Um, but it's the most labor-intensive on the farm. It, what, what I can tell you is at scale for me. And it takes a while to get to, to that at scale. So this goes back to what we said earlier. Like you really can't look at the margins too much early on. I want to see positive cash flow, not dollars per hour. Knowing that, okay, well, my goal is to turn this into a full-time business with a good paying salary, not a poverty level salary. I, when I'm selling a whole chicken, I'm trying to, and this is something I teach on in the course extensively, and this really goes to selling a whole pig or a whole cow too. And this is just kind of where it's fallen for me. I'm trying to 2X my money. So my production costs at this point are about 275 a pound doing 500 to 600 birds. If I weren't doing that many birds, if I were still doing 150 at a time, my production costs would be, gosh, probably 375 to 4 bucks. And so that's I think if that's if that's where you're at production wise, if that's where you're at marketing list wise, like it just is what it is and you again, it's the light at the end of the tunnel knowing I can get my cost down through economies of scale, I'm working for the long term. I want to get to a point where I can 2x. So if I'm at 275 like this year, I'm selling my chickens for 549 a pound on a whole chicken. Now, on the chickens I'm parting out, I'm trying to hit 2.5 to 3x my cost. Now, there's – and there's a little bit more cost in there, and I've got to sell it 
piece by piece so there's more marketing time. But those are some rules of thumb. You kind of got to balance all that out with, well, this is where I'm at in the market. This is what people are willing to pay. This is where I fit in. Am I at the low end, the high end? Am I in the middle because of how I manage, what I feed, the the breed I'm raising? Um, am I doing wholesale or retail? Am I going to go pound the pavement at the farmer's market every week so I can capture the most dollars possible? Or do I just want to drop off 150 chickens once a month to this grocery store and take less margin, but the marketing's a whole lot easier? You know, these these are all things that you, you kind of got to start to massage together. And I don't really think there's any answer for this except experience. You can project, but just know your projections are absolutely going to change. So here's a situation I think a lot of people are in. They run the spreadsheet and they have numbers that come out, let's say similar to yours. 275 a pound is their cost. It's organic. Then they want to go out and sell birds at their best local farmer's market. And that market right now has other poultry producers at it. And let's say they're at 425, 450 a pound low. You are doubling up. You're at five fifty, six dollars a pound. If you're going into a market and dropping kind of a a price bomb where you're you're twenty five or thirty percent higher than your closest competitor, but you are different. I think a lot of people they go to start selling at that market and they kind of open their market booth to crickets in the beginning because people are just shopping on price and it'll just take time. So when you have your data of cost estimate and you see competitors out there, but the competitors are low, even if the product's different, how do you have the courage to go out there and charge what you should charge, even if that means slow sales at first. I, I'm looking at what Excel spit now, and I, I go right back to what I said earlier. Like, if I can't make a living doing this, then I, I'm going to go do something else. Um, and for us early on, you know, we weren't using organic, we were using GMO free, and we were paying this huge premium for grain. So I was always more expensive. I just passionately explained that, like, I, I'm not cheaper and here's why. And I didn't make any apologies for it. I never said I'm sorry. And people that complained about my price, I'm like, yeah, you know what? This isn't a fit. You, you can go down here and save money. Um, you know, your health is your health. It has absolutely no bearing on me. So, you know, I, I just take a very libertarian approach to it. Like, you vote with your feet in your wallet. Um, I will tell you that at a farmer's market, it takes, if you're brand new, it's going to be about year three, year three before you're really going to get a lot of traction. That's my experience. Um, I'm in year three this year at our primary Saturday market, which we moved to three years ago. And I'd been doing another local area market for six years had an excellent reputation. It's the only reason I was able to switch into this market was because of our reputation and because of our animal husbandry practices, particularly that we were known as kind of the, you know, the quote unquote, like the organic option. Um, this is like, the market's been good. It's been steady. Don't get me wrong. Year three this year, like it, it's, it's really taken off. Like our, our average the first two years was in, was within like one and a half percent between 16 and 17. This year, I, you know, and I'll, I'll do a postmortem at the end of the year. I'll take all my sales and put it into a spreadsheet and look at what was my daily average. How does that compare to previous years? I'm going to say we're probably going to be up 20, 25 percent this year. Like it just takes time to build a clientele. You're building the, this is very relational marketing to get the, all the dollars, to get the most bang for the, the buck. 
you're establishing a relationship. You're going to know your customers on a first name basis. It takes a whole lot of time. And again, again, this is something we spend a whole lot of time on in the course. And th this is where the rubber meets the road. All this production and Excel and all this other crap doesn't mean anything. If you can't convey your story and participate in relational marketing and demonstrate why, in my case, I'm worth five forty nine a pound when they can they can walk seven or eight booths away and pay four bucks a pound for a whole chicken. I've got to be able to justify that six to eight dollar upcharge. But there's a certain percentage of people that want not just local, they they want something that is, we'll say, functionally organic. I'm not certified organic. I don't market that I'm certified organic. In fact, I tell people I'm not. But we are functionally doing everything that we can in an organic manner. And it's local. It's butchered locally. The grain's local. And oh, by the way, our stuff tastes really good. You know, the proof's in the pudding. I have a lot of people that come and buy from me. They're like, yeah, I've been buying this guy's stuff for a while. And it wasn't bad. But then we decided we'd try you one day. And we're like, oh, gosh, this is more expensive. And then we tasted it and we're sold. Like I, I hear that every couple of weeks. So if you're producing a good product beyond all the health benefits and the environmental stuff and all this, people are going to resonate with that. And they're going to pay that premium. So is the reality of it when you're starting out, the spreadsheet is what it is. You've done all the work that you can to get those numbers as low as possible based upon actual market research. And then you have a number to work off of. You go out and then you try and sell that product for what you need to sell it for, given your context. And you need to give it enough time to have the business gain traction. And maybe that's a full season at a market or a year. And then you evaluate at the end of it whether it worked or not. But without doing all of that and without flexing on it, you can't question it. In other words, you can't go out there and say, okay, we need to sell it for $550. Start selling it for $550. No sales come in and then you drop it to $450 when that's not what you really needed. And you can't go back and question your costs if they are truly accurate. The numbers are what they are. Set the price you need to charge for your situation. Go out there, try and do it. Give it enough time to give it a chance to work. Give it enough time for you to figure out how to market that product at that price effectively. And then at the end, decide, does it have legs? Was it a success? Or do we fold this up and do something else? Yeah, it, it really is pretty much that simple. The one caveat I'll add, Diego, is that I'm going to say 90% of the time, and I've, I've seen this in consulting, and I've seen this in the, the workshops we've done, um, and to some extent in, uh, in the, the Facebook group, uh, for the course, the, the people who've been through the full course, whether that's online or in person, we've got a private Facebook group. There's a lot of good conversation that comes out of there. 90% of the time, if you tell me we just can't sell it at this price, there's something else that we can tweak. And that might be your market stand, the aesthetics. It might be who you're sending to the market, the storytelling your displays, your communication, the market you choose. You know, if you're in your little, your hometown, and my hometown is like 15,000 people, like I'm not selling $5.49 chicken here. I got to drive 50 minutes to get that price. And that is a wonderful trade. Okay. Uh, I did the hometown market for part of a season to, to try it out back when I first started. A good day there was 150 bucks. Okay. Um, a good day at our current Saturday markets, pushing 2,000. You can't tell me it's not worth driving 50 minutes versus 10 minutes. Um, there are all kinds of things we can change to convey what it is we're selling 
and and then justifying the cost for it. But it, it may be as simple as like you've you've got to, you know, get a, again. I'll use a baseball reference. You got to get out of single A and double A and get to the major leagues, and that means driving into the big city, into the right area of the big city where you've got consumers that are willing to pay for this kind of product. And I think for most people, if that means driving up to two hours to a good farmer's market, then that's what you do if that's your business model. But there's normally something we can fix. If you're saying, I can't get my price, there's something we can fix beyond. It's very rare that it's like, okay, yeah, you're out in the middle of Wyoming and like you literally would have to drive five hours each way to get to a big market and people around you just aren't going to pay for that. Th- those instances exist, but for most people it's correctable. But I do think you've got to put, you've got to put in the work. You got to build a spreadsheet. You got to determine your price is your price. You forecast a little bit. Yeah. Maybe you fudge it down some based on that economies of scale, future projection to get it in line with where you want to be in two or three years, not where you're at today. So maybe you're making a little bit less early on, knowing that if you can get all these other things going and you can gain traction for your business and your marketing, that high profitability is going to come in time. And that's where I'm willing to defer, you know, what I'm making per hour for the long term, knowing that we're, we're building this business for the long term. And eventually we're, we're firing on all cylinders and it comes. Um, and that just takes time. And as an Americans, we're very spoiled. We're very impatient. And we think it should happen instantaneously. And it's not. Farming is not fast. Building a business is not fast. There's no get rich quick scheme here. Um, I've, I have demonstrated on my farm at this point in its existence, um, you know, last year, uh, we had a, a very productive batch of chickens. And this isn't every batch, but we had a very, very productive batch of chickens. And we, we off one acre, you know, our, our net was about $11,000. Now that's, again, that's not every batch, but I am targeting, you know, 8,000, 8,500, 9,000 bucks on a, on a batch of chicken. Um, But with all the, the time and effort and labor that goes into it, like I have to, you know, I just, I, I just, that's, it is what it is. Um, you know, a case in point for this would, would be Turkey, uh, to switch gears a little bit. And, and here's why I bring this up. When I first entered into the Turkey market, I, I came in at five forty nine dollars a pound. There was no other producer around me that was over four bucks, but I knew lots of producers trying to raise four to 600 turkeys because that's what their spreadsheet told them to do to make money. And they couldn't market that many turkeys. So they would sell 300 at $4 a pound. And then that last hundred to to two or 300 turkeys, they'd have to do like crazy sales and sell them at cost just to get rid of them because they didn't have the room to store them. Well, here I am. I come in. I do a hundred turkeys at five forty nine a pound. I've only got a hundred turkeys to sell, and I made more money on a hundred turkeys than they were making on four to six hundred turkeys. And I know that's a fact from two or three other farms I dealt with when we first started doing turkeys in two thousand ten. So you're better off to to produce less, charge what you need to charge, and outmarket your competitors. And that's that's always been the moniker of what we've done here. You know, I'll make more money per unit so I can do a whole lot less units. And boy, that really takes the pressure off marketing. And that's the hard part. That's the scary part is the sales in marketing. I mean, you can only cut costs so much and everybody's dealing with the same costs. The only way you're going to be able to grow is do a higher volume of sales, to do a larger sale per customer and to do more sale per unit. And that really just comes down to the perception you're creating around your product. It's how you market it. That's why there's premium beers, premium purses, premium makeup, premium cars. It's just a marketing game. There's not that much else that's different. And there's a lot in the course that talks on marketing and differentiating yourself and and finding the right market. 
But I think that's the part that, that scares people and that's the part that a lot of people struggle with and maybe something we'll take on in a future episode. But for now, you can learn more about all that in the course. Yeah, and that's, I mean, honestly, that's that's why I've put so much emphasis on those things in the course because it is sorely lacking in the space. There are no shortage of, re- of resources you know, to learn the, the, the how to animal management side. I, I think I've got a lot to add to that conversation, right? But there are lots of good resources out there, but there are no good resources, which is where we come in with farm business essentials to tie all this together and tackle the, the, you know, what enterprise do I start with first and why and holistic context and, Assessing your market and coming up with a marketing plan. And then, oh, by the way, having a group of peers that have gone through the same material that are there to bounce ideas off of. You know, it's just really comprehensive. And yeah, frankly, it's to me, if you're if you're going at this and, and, and trying to make a buck, it's a no brainer. There you have it. The cost of raising pasture poultry. I hope this one translated well into audio format, and I hope it really resonated. One thing that Darby and I try and do with this podcast, with the blog posts, and with the course is really lay things out clearly from a base principles perspective. So regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of what type of meat product you're selling, you could use this same type of analysis to figure out the cost associated with that enterprise. So if you're thinking about starting a farm enterprise or you're currently operating one, do you know what your costs are? And are you pricing your product appropriately given those costs? If you want to learn more about starting a pastured poultry enterprise, we can help. One of the resources that we offer through Grassfed Life is the Profitable Pastured Poultry Online Course. That course focuses on everything that you need to start, run, and manage a profitable pastured poultry enterprise. From marketing to brooder management to pasture management, everything is in there, including plans on how to build your own chicken tractor, just like Darby has. That course is built upon Darby's knowledge of profitably operating a pastured poultry enterprise on his farm for over 10 years. That's an enterprise that he started for $600 and one that now generates over $30,000 per year. You don't need a lot of land to do it and you don't need a lot of money to start. So if you're thinking about starting up a livestock-based enterprise in 2019, think about looking at pastured poultry because it's probably the easiest and most accessible for a lot of you listening to this. And if you're going to start on that journey, start your journey off on the right foot and set yourself up for success with the Profitable Pastured Poultry online course. That course is very reasonably priced given how much you can make on a small land base with a small number of birds and a small amount of startup capital. Use your time wisely and make the most of your investment by following the proven plan outlined in the Profitable Pastured Poultry online course. Learn more at grassfedlife.co. Thanks for listening to the episode today. I'll be back again next week with another episode of Grassfed Life. Until then, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.